All right, I'm feeling motivated, guys. It was a long break from uh, making any videos, but after doing the uh, last Trance X129 video that I did, and I went super long-winded on it, um, I did it without uh, very much editing at all, if none. Uh, basically none. Uh, so I'm feeling good. It's way easier to make the videos this way. Um, this one is a Friday night. Um, finished a day at the shop building a bunch of bikes when I built this bike here. Um, got out for a really good ride and uh, I'm doing this before I have a shower. So that's how motivated I am. I'm filming this before going to have a shower after a ride. Uh, this is the 2022 Giant Stance uh, 29 2, a somewhat upgraded version of the Stance because the Stance has been around for a couple of years. I am going to go over the bike's uh, details, specification, geometry, and suitability. What kind of a rider this bike is uh, really good for. And uh, that's kind of the gig here. Um, I think I've got 30 or 40 videos about different bikes and uh, we talk about them and uh, about the details and hopefully you learn some stuff. So let's go. All righty. So as I mentioned, this is a 2022 Giant Stance 29-2. This is a entry-level full suspension bike with 120 millimeters of suspension in the back, 130 millimeter fork, and I am going to make a thesis about this video that I think this is one of the two best bike shop entry-level bikes uh, you can find out there. We happen to sell the other one that I think is equally as good but just different and that would be the Marin Rift Zone. Um, probably I would compare it to a Rift Zone 29 1. Um, I think this and that Rift Zone are the two best ways that you can get into a full suspension bike um, without breaking the $2,500 barrier. Before anybody comments uh, about the, this is more expensive for, it's too expensive, what's going on with the pricing? We're in Canada. These are Canadian prices. You wouldn't believe how many videos that I say that and then people comment like, your prices are too high. I see this price, but they're in the States. So 2049, stance 29, two. 120 mil, 120 millimeters in the back, 130 millimeter in the front. Components on this guy are pretty respectable. It's got a Shimano Dior 1x10 drivetrain. So there's a couple things on here that they took kind of shortcuts, but the overall package I think makes a very good overall bike. Going 1x10 means that instead of having an 11 to 51 tooth range or 10 to 51 tooth range like we would uh, potentially see on a Dior 11 or 12 speed. It means we have a range from 11 to 46 teeth there. Up until these new 12 speeds came out, 11 to 46 was basically as big a range as we had on 1 by 11. So while it isn't a huge range of gears, um, the shifting is quite good. It is a little bit less finicky being a 10 speed rather than 11 or 12 speed. This Shimano Dior derailleur actually has a clutch on there. So that's that guy there. So a clutch means when it's turned off, which it is right now, you have minimal tension on your chain. When that's turned on, that gets really stiff. So that is part of what makes a one by drivetrain work really well. And that's Shimano's way of doing it. Paired with that is a Praxis sort of a narrow wide, but it's not actually a narrow wide chain ring, but just the shape of these teeth and then the fact that they actually uh, alternate from kind of left to right the way they do this um, gives you some pretty good chain retention on there. So you do get the uh, simplicity of a one by drivetrain, a good range of gears, not a great range of gears. But I think that that is quite a nice drivetrain, especially better than any bike that would be compared to this that would come with SRAM SX. If you look at a lot of videos reviewing SRAM SX, if you find any that actually rave about the performance, I would be shocked. 
The big thing with SRAM SX is that it might start off working well, or it may not. Um, and it seems to deteriorate, deteriorate fairly quickly um, with use because of the amount of plastic that is incorporated in a SRAM SX drivetrain. So I would much prefer at this price point to see this Dior 1x10 drivetrain and give up a little bit of gear range than to see a 12-speed SRAM SX drivetrain. That is an opinion, but I think it's a fairly common opinion. Going together with that, we just look at things like our tire spec. This is a Maxxis Forecaster 29 by 2.35. This is in an EXO casing, so that means that the tire is designed to be somewhat light. And it's not only tubeless ready, but it is actually set up tubeless from the factory. So Giant includes that tubeless valve when they send us um, the bike and they include sealant and as we're building the bike we put the sealant in set it up and you are saving yourselves um, probably about a hundred bucks um, over buying what is more common that you get tubeless ready tires but you still have to buy valves still have to tape rims and still have to buy some sealant so that's part of the value here for 2500 bucks you're getting a proper tubeless setup and it's actually set up ready to go Tubeless matters to you because that means you can run your tires a little bit softer, which really helps you to get um, extra performance when riding off-road. And a soft tire will sort of grab um, looser ground or roots or rocks much better than a firmer tire that you would need to be running if you had a tube in there. The Maxxis Forecaster, I wouldn't uh, ever identify that as my favorite Maxxis tire, um, but it is a sensible tire for this bike. So that's one of the things that when we talk about this bike, there is a holistic approach to this bike where they're not trying to design a dumbed down, super hardcore bike, which would then have hardcore tires designed for aggressive riding. The idea with this bike, and that goes from geometry to specifications, um, including things like those tires, is that Giant is trying to make a bike here that helps to get somebody who isn't aggressive, they don't imagine themselves becoming a super aggressive rider, but they want a comfortable, confidence-inspiring um, bike ride. So especially if your trails aren't super steep, up or down, um, but they still have some roots, rocks, some loose stuff um, that would take advantage of having full suspension, I think that this is a really nice choice. Going back into some more details here, we see some nice chain stay protection, so that's going to help in addition with having that clutch on there. That extra rubber coating on there just means that as you're going over really chundery stuff, if your chain bounces hard enough that it actually knocks against there, it quietens things quite a bit. Your rear shock on here, it's an air shock. It is a Suntour Radon shock. So an air shock is important because that means that you can set the air pressure to work um, appropriately for your body weight. So when you're doing that, you're basically checking how much that shock sags just by having your body weight on there. And then you can set up the bike to work in the range in about 25 to 30% of this overall stroke here is um, basically what you're looking for when you're setting up the bike. And an air shock allows you to do that. Um, as part of that, you also, it's kind of hidden in there, but there is a little red dial. So the difference between just having a shock on your bike and having proper bike um, suspension, I would say, is being able to control your rebound on, on the shock. So after you set your air pressure, you adjust your rebound. So when you push your shock down hard, it comes back quickly, but under control, not just like pushing down on a pogo stick. Um, so controlled suspension is part of uh, the formula to get proper behaving suspension. Um, this is a single pivot design. So as part of Giant's efforts to uh, keep the cost down on this bike, you just have a main pivot here, and then it's all one piece going back to the axle and up to here. So they will call this um, a flex point, I think is their uh, kind of branded terminology. Um, 
the idea there being that you get an ever so slight angle change in this as it goes through the travel and the frame itself is designed to flex just a little bit to allow that to happen and to not require any other links happening back here. So it uh, does a couple things. It helps them to reduce price and it gives you a natural paddle, pedaling platform, I would say. And by pedaling platform, um, that basically means you just have a little bit of extra firmness um, under the suspension so that you don't feel it being um, so soft and gushy that it's sort of robbing you of your energy. The other part of what makes it quite efficient is if you look where that pivot is placed, it's sort of in line with the chain. This means um, you probably have some decent anti-squat numbers. An anti-squat is basically the mechanical design of the frame actually using the tension in your chain when you're pedaling to actually help um, to offset the bike's natural tendency to bob a little bit under your, your weight um, moving around as you're pedaling. So an efficient pedaling bike um, for a couple different reasons. Um, definitely worth a test ride for somebody. Uh, I mentioned that um, Praxis chainring, we also have Praxis alloy cadet cranks on here. Mentioned the shock. Um, a big thing that we have going on here is a dropper seat post which I think is part of what would make any bike um, a nice uh, actual mountain bike. Um, a lot of people, if this is say their first time that they're thinking of a full suspension bike and looking at a video like this, may not even be familiar with what's going on with the dropper. But essentially what a dropper does is gives you quick access to raising and lowering your seat quickly. So you have that lever there your post and you press the button and it is always sprung to the top. Um, and then when you want it to go back down again, you just put your weight on the saddle, um, press the button and your seat can go down to anywhere in this range that we have here of the post. So this is about the cheapest full suspension. I think it is the cheapest full suspension bike shop brand that you'll see with a dropper seat post on it. Um, and it's a reasonable amount of travel on here. This is a size large. I believe they say that this has 150 millimeter, um, so six inches of drop to that post, the difference between its top and bottom height. Uh, the Giant Romero saddle, if you watch a lot of my videos, you will probably get sick of me saying I love this saddle. I think it's quite comfortable, um, as opposed to a lot of uh, saddles that come on stock bikes feel like obviously like trash. This is very much a personal preference though. So depending on your particular physiology, you may or may not like it, but it's um, at least getting a better score than the previous model that Giant used to put on their bikes, which almost everybody instantly would say, uh, no, thank you. Um, we have internal cable routing on here. So this is your dropper, dropper cable, for example. It just goes down internally through the frame and up into the bottom of your post. That is your uh, rear derailleur cable, your rear brake cable there. It just keeps things clean, not having uh, any kind of cables here. And it also means if you use something like a tailgate pad on your truck to carry your bikes, you don't have cables underneath that you're gonna damage. I'm going to the fork on this bike. This is Giant's in-house fork. This is what they call a Crest 34, so that means that it's got a 34 mil stanchion. So that is when you're looking at a bike with 130 mil travel fork, that's the common size that you would see from Fox um, and probably a bit bigger than the most common thing you would see from Rock Shocks. The thickness of that is going to basically play into the stiffness of the front end of the bike. So a 34 is very appropriate and on the stiffer side of things. Um, this fork, I think, has a neat way of doing their arch with the way they do that hole through there. It is an air fork, which means that, like I talked about, that rear uh, shock you have underneath this cap here, you have um, a valve that you can fill up with air. And once again, just like you're setting your rear pressure for your body weight, you can do it with the fork. Um, what I always tell people is that the fork pressure 
isn't quite as defined a uh, measurement as your rear shock because people will tend to ride their forks at different pressures depending on their riding style. So if you're somebody who, if you see a pile of roots or rocks and if you kind of think, oh, I'm just gonna unweight over the whole thing and kind of smack off the first one and get airborne, uh, that person tends to ride their fork a little bit stiffer or the person who just looks at all that stuff and says, yeah, that's why I bought suspension. Uh, and they just go blasting right through it. Um, those people tend to ride their sh shocks a little bit softer. I would say considering who I think that this bike is ideally suited for, you're probably going to be riding with a softer shock. You're going to be using your suspension to make things more comfortable and confident. You're not uh, looking to get playful and uh, catching a lot of air time or anything. Front tire is the same as the rear. It is that Maxxis Forecaster 29 by 2.35. The front and rear rims on this, I think they're a 27 millimeter wide internal width. So on budget bikes, that is, uh, this is considered budget, which is ridiculous for 2,500 bucks. But in the world of high performance mountain bikes, um, 2,500 is a budget full suspension. 27 millimeter wide rim is on the wide side for a budget bike, I would say. An extra width when you're looking at rims basically helps you to get um, better performance out of your tire um, because your tire is less likely to um, just fold over when being ridden softly to take advantage of a soft tubeless tire. Going up to the cockpit, um, these grips are terrible. Um, my first suggestion for anybody with this bike would be to upgrade to grips that have a lock-on and my personal preference is a bike that feels less like a pile of mush than this. Um, that is a place where they're saving money. This is a common thing that I will comment on a lot of bikes. I think that if you're actually mountain biking, you should just have lock on grips because from the way you're um, holding the bars and going through bumps and everything, what we see is if a, a bike doesn't have lock on grips is those grips will end up migrating in or out or you end up getting dirt underneath the actual grip from uh, as soon as you have your first um, little crash on the bike you get dirt stuffed under the grips and then your grips want to just move around or be throttle grips spin on you so grips are junk brakes are not too bad these are a um, tektro brake on here this bike officially um, comes with one of two different types of brakes either these Tektro brakes or the original specification on the bike was to have a Shimano um, MT200 brake. These are Tektro M280s. I think that these are probably at least as good as the Shimano's that are spec'd. Um, you see Tektro's being spec'd on a lot of different bikes. This is a higher model than what you see on virtually everything else at a lower price point. Uh, from these guys and part of what they're doing with it being a higher model is the amount of um, This is what they call the master cylinder here um, the volume of this is bigger than on the cheaper version so with more um, high, uh, Mineral oil that you have in the brake here the more of that means that it takes more braking to heat up that oil and heated up oil is what will affect your braking power on a longer descent. So a nicer overall feel. I think the quality of materials is better than that cheap, cheap version of the, uh, the Tektro brakes. Um, so it feels nicer and I think works a little bit nicer um, and the sound and feel and everything. So this is how it looks down at the brake itself. This is a 160 millimeter rotor on here. So once again, they are not aiming at a super uh, hardcore rider. If it was, they would put a bigger rotor on there. But I think once again, this is appropriate for that person who isn't super aggressive, but wants the comfort and confidence of full suspension. They do at least put a hundred meter rotor on here. So that's something that's So please that. Confirmed. 180 millimeters. So, uh, 180 mil brake on the front, that's because your front brake um, has the potential to be a much more useful, more powerful brake than your rear. Um, another thing to note is 
This fork has, I'm gonna go back around here. It is a through axle fork. So you actually have a 15 millimeter thick axle that goes through and that helps to stiffen up the front end of the bike. You would be seeing on some of the other bikes that try to compete at this level, um, they might be putting on a fork that doesn't even have a through axle that would just have a quick release. And it does actually affect how um, connected to the ground you sort of feel. There's a red knob there. That is like I talked about on that rear shock. That's where you're controlling the rebound after you've adjusted your air pressure. The stem on here is, I believe, a 60 millimeter long stem. And I'm just looking at my cheat. See, I got a cheat sheet here. Um, that's just the printout from the giant website, so I can check that I'm not uh, lying to you about stuff. We'll say it's a 60 millimeter long stem. Once again, I think that that doesn't represent what is considered hardcore or cool these days, but it does work with this overall bike. Um, color looks good. We've got kind of a, uh, a gloss going to a satin finish on here. They're, I think they've done a really, really nice job with the, uh, the finishes and everything on this bike. Um, so to just discuss a couple other things. Um, so the pros on this bike, I would say that dropper, a big pro. I think that anybody that's actually going to ride on mountain bike trails, once they can, they learn to sort of uh, second nature work with the dropper, it's a must. That Dior 1x10 drivetrain, really good. That Crest 34 fork, while it isn't a high performance fork, it does give you enough adjustment with the air pressure um, and it's a relatively light fork. Um, so it helps to keep this bike at a reasonable weight. Um, having tubeless tires from the factory and actual name brand tires from Maxxis, I think that that is a big bonus as well. So drivetrain, dropper, that fork, the tires, big props to Giant for doing that. I mentioned uh, some of the things that affect the weight. The overall weight of this bike is 31.3 pounds as it sits. This is a size large. So if you're getting a medium or a small, if, you can, if you're lucky enough to track down one of these, uh, you may save a little bit of money. The only major con I would say, um, considering who this is intended for, is the grips. Um, they're trash. Put some lock-ons on there, it'll cost you 30 to 40 bucks. You can put, do something with some color to make this bike feel a bit more personalized for you. The other one I would say is just regarding these Praxis cranks and chain rings. Um, they work for holding the chain with their version of a narrow wide um, kind of a chain ring on here, but they're not as good as a true narrow wide. So if you ended up losing your chain a lot, I suspect you're riding this bike to its limits at that point, which might be a little bit of a hint. Um, but yeah, you might want to change to uh, something that can put some narrow wide chain rings on there. Um, I should mention, as I'm just looking, there's the uh, Giant Alex logo. Giant does an amazing job with their alloy frames. Um, between the quality of their welding to the manipulation of tubes to make things strong while still being light, they are... Um, they're really, really good. I mean, we see a lot of bikes come through and just the precision that this is built to, even though it is, like I said, an entry level full suspension is quite impressive. So on to the geometry of this bike. If you're considering this bike, and as I described this bike not being for a super aggressive rider, um, we're seeing a big shift in the world of bike geometry these days where Seat posts are getting very, very vertical on a lot of modern bikes. That is basically a very vertical seat post that caters to an extremely powerful rider because it means as you're riding up steeper hills, you are more naturally positioned over your cranks. The, let's see if we can make that angle, the slacker that the seat tube is down to about 73 and a half degrees, I would say that a lot of road bikes are in that sort of range. Um, it favors a little bit flatter kind of a surface. 
This particular one is at 75 degrees. I think that that is a spot on seat angle for the intended rider of this bike. Um, the other angle that you often see talked about on um, mountain bikes these days is the head angle. So that is that angle there. That is slack, a smaller number. That is steep, uh, um, a bigger number. This is at 67 and a half degrees. Uh, six or seven years ago, that was considered a super hardcore um, kind of an angle. It seemed like the mountain bike world chased itself down to 67 degrees, stalled there for a little bit, um, and then went slacker than that. Part of the reason I think that there was a bit of a stall there was because to go slacker than 67 degrees starts to really require um, an aggressive riding style and um, correct technique. I think what this bike does with that 67 and a half degrees is it gives you a slack enough angle that you're going to feel stable. You're not going to feel like um, if you touch your brakes, you're going to be tossed over the handlebars. And it allows you to start building on the kind of skills that would help you to get to um, one of those modern bikes with a very slack head tube angle um, without you just having a rough time of feeling like um, every time you went around a loose corner your front tire was washing out on you. I say this stuff because we've heard from a number of customers that don't even have extremely slack bikes and you just hear that they they struggle somewhat and they're in and they're thinking their tires are bad, they're thinking that there's something going on because as they're going around corners and they're a little bit of a timid rider, uh, the front wheel washes out and it's because their weight is back on the bike rather than really weighting um, on their arms and leaning the bike a lot rather than just steering your bike like that. That's what you do on a steep bike and just leaning the bike over is what you're doing when you're on a, a really slack bike. So this, I think, helps to uh, fill that void that somebody can have a positive experience as they become good. And then at the point where they know that they're moving out of this bike, it makes sense then to go to a really uh, progressive geometry bike. Um, so we know our weight, 31.3 pounds, 29 inch wheels, 24.99 in Canada. Um, hard to track down. I apologize for doing videos on bikes that are hard to track down, but somewhere in the world somebody's probably going to be getting shown a picture of this bike and a chance that they could have one in a month. And so they have to try and do their shopping um, without a bike to test ride because you're going to have to put your money down um, probably before the bike even arrives to secure it. I hope that this gives you some idea of if this bike is appropriate for you. Um, this is a size large. Um, I would say on this bike, a size large is suitable for 5.10 to 6.1. A size medium, 5.7 to 5.10. A size small would be 5.4 to 5.7. And an extra large would be about 6.1 to 6.4, maybe up to 6.5, but probably up to 6.4. Um, that is the 2022 Giant Stance 29.2. Um, and those were a bunch of thoughts about this bike and I hope that you find this useful. If you like this sort of stuff, maybe a little bit of talking about things that we're not seeing on uh, regular reviews and you're a bit of a bike nerd, um, give it a like, maybe subscribe. Um, I will keep on doing this and we cover everything from gravel bikes to hardtails, budget hardtails even, up to uh, $10,000 complete mountain bikes. Thanks so much for watching. Have an awesome time. Happy trails if you can get out there soon and uh, carry on.